Hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us for the Q&A session with David Lindemeyer. We've got David on the phone um, as he is out in the field at the moment doing important work. So thank you so much for joining us, David. Uh, it's a pleasure, thank you. All right, so Professor David Lindemeyer is um, from the Australian National University. Um, and I'm just gonna start the session off by doing an acknowledgement of country. So BioLinks Alliance is proud to acknowledge the traditional owners of the places where we live and work. We recognize and respect the enduring relationships they have with their lands and water, and we pay our respects to elders past, present and future. I also wanna um, remind everyone in this session that it is being recorded. So we please ask for you to keep your camera and microphone off for the duration of the event. Um, we are going to be, like I said, doing a Q&A. So the uh, purpose of this is obviously to allow everyone to ask questions of David. Obviously, we've had a lot of great engagement on his keynote talk. So I'm sure everyone here is keen to ask some questions and get some great answers from David. So I will um, be asking you to uh, unmute your microphone uh, as we get to each person's question. And I think what we're going to do is we're going to start off with some questions from Gail Osborne, who submitted a few prior to the session. So, Gail, if you're there, would you like to unmute your microphone and ask a question? Hi, Sasha. I'm coming from another. Can no worries, Gail. Go for it. Oh, good. Um, so, David, the Wombat State Forest has the substantial greater glider population, um, the only population west of the Hume and the western edge of their range. And no, we've got great numbers there. Try 11 gliders in 800 metres. Anyway, a monitoring program has recently been set up by DWELP in-house, mainly to look at the effects of planned burns on greater gliders. And we're really concerned that this might cause local extinctions that have appeared like we've feel that some of the burns have caused some local extinctions already. So have you any comments on this program? I'm actually not aware of, of, of what DELP's doing in, in that space. Um, th there's no doubt that there's other work that's been done by DELP that shows that uh, prescribed burning can take out very large old trees. Large trees sometimes are more flammable because of the amount of dead wood that's in those trees. Um, I suppose, I'm, I'm not trying to escape the question, I, I don't know much about the detail of what's planned there. Um, I suppose one of the issues is if the burns can be truly low severity burns and low intensity burns, severity and intensity aren't the same thing, but if they can be very low intensity burns then it's possible that the impacts on the gliders might be relatively limited. But I really need to, to have a look and see what they're, what's, what's, uh, what's happening there. My hope is that some of the, the more significant parts of the distribution of the species in that wombat area, which I do know is a significant population, they must have uh, quite a large number of control areas where they don't do any burning to make sure that uh, in, the, in the case that there are major problems with burning, at least there are still significant populations remaining. Um, but I would need to find out more detail on that and I'll, uh, I'll endeavour to do so. Thanks, Gail. Did you have a follow-up question? Oh, yes. <laughs> we a good go at this. Go um, for it. <laughs> so the other thing that really we've been wondering about is whether any research has been carried out on the effects of smoke from both planned burns and bushfires on greater gliders. So given that humans suffer from inhalation from smoke particles, um, you would think it would, they would also affect gliders. And then we had the deaths of smoky mice from smoke from the Canberra fires. So do we know if this is a problem for greater gliders? I've never seen any work in, in that space on animals, never seen any work. Um, I would hazard a guess that uh, species like the greater glider may do less badly than others, simply because it doesn't 
it, it's not terribly active at night. It tends to do things um, at a fairly sedentary pace. But I, I'm just guessing. I've never seen any work on the direct effects of smoke on on wildlife. Obviously, there's a lot of work done, particularly from University of Tasmania and Charles Darwin University, on the effects of smoke uh, on humans. Um, it's an interesting question. I've, I've actually never thought about that. I did see the little little piece on smoky mice and and um, effects of smoke, um, but I've never seen any really detailed form. It would be quite difficult to do. I'd imagine you'd have to to uh, look at it. Um, probably in captivity, and I suspect that the chances of being able to get that kind of work done for ethics committees would be virtually zero. Certainly our ethics committee wouldn't allow it. Um, perhaps others would, but I don't think so. Interesting question, though. What Sorry, I can't, I can't give you more well, definitive we response. Then, if, if you found um, dead gliders after... Um, after a bushfire, you might be able to look at them from that angle. Yeah, that's 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 a thought. Except that the also gliders are very very susceptible to high temperatures. So Cara's Cara Young and Tob's work is suggesting that um, very high overnight temperatures are, are really bad news for greater gliders. Um, because of the additional metabolic heat that, that um, gliders have to, to generate when they're ingesting what's what's a pretty ordinary kind of diet. Um, the other thing is that often associated with with uh, wildfires is a prolonged period of drought prior to the fire. So you've got several things going on in that are going to, to make it pretty challenging for gliders. First of all is for long periods of drought, and we know that that has an effect on their reproductive rate. And there is data on that. Uh, or there are data on that. We know that um, gliders are susceptible to higher temperatures. There was work, physiological work done on that in the early 1980s. And Cara's work is suggesting there's a, an interaction between higher temperatures, uh, diet, and, and um, animal health and physiology. So adding smoke to that is not going to help animals that are already likely to be under pretty significant stress, I suggest. Fantastic. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for your questions, Cheers. Gail. Uh, I'm going to ask Bert Lobert to unmute, as I know you have a question that you've posted in the chat, Bert, if you're there, if you can hear us. Yeah, I can hear. So okay, Go ahead. Thanks. Um, so this is about squirrel gliders, David. Um, so squirrels, are, you know, certainly externally so similar to sugar gliders. Um, and also there's that other kind of genera in, in the group, yellow belly gliders and squirrel gliders size wise are in between the two. Um, sugars are so widespread, have, you know, occupy diverse habitat from sea level to altitude. The two species, sugars and squirrels, they can be very difficult to separate in the field. Do you have any insight about why squirrels are so much more specialised than sugars? And, and, and does our understanding of genetic differences pro provide any clues to that? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, I, I suppose the partial overlay in the case is that the... Um, the sugar glider is about to be broken up into, I think, up to five different species. Um, just like the greater glider is about to be broken up into into a handful of different species and some distinct subspecies as well. So it's interesting how often that happens when you have a really widespread species that people begin to dig into and have a good look at and discover that what they thought was one tends out to be multiple. Um, why is the sugar glider... Uh, so successful and the squirrel glider so so specialised. Yeah, it's it, it's an interesting thought. Um, certainly, the sugar glider has been effectively reintroduced around the islands off New Guinea and also obviously into Tasmania. Um, 
and and we are seeing an increase in population of sugar gliders in the in the ash forest, particularly where it's been heavily disturbed. So so perhaps it's a it's an animal that's that's geared to to more disturbed environments than something like the the squirrel glider. Certainly, the um, association with very large trees for squirrel gliders seems to be quite important. Mason Crane's PhD work and subsequent work in the southwest slopes where I am now suggested really strong associations of, of squirrel gliders with very large paddock trees, particularly when they're in flower, but also very large trees um, for nesting. And that doesn't seem to be the case with a smaller body sugar glider. Well, having said that, we very rarely saw, we've very rarely seen sugar gliders in, in 20 years of spotlighting on the southwest slopes. So I think there's something more to the story in terms of um, why, why both species are quite rare, but, but why one seems to be quite widely distributed and, and the other one seems to be very specialised. My, my underlying sense is that the squirrel glider, certainly the southern form, is much more strongly associated with woodlands, which have done very badly. And the, and the sugar glider tends to be much more of a forest species. And it kind of resembles many of the, the woodland birds that aren't doing particularly well, uh, often reasonably common in forests. Things like rufous whistlers, Eastern yellow robins, flame robins. Some of those birds actually do quite well in forests, just like sugar gliders seem to do very well in all kinds of different forests. Uh, it's a good question though, Bert. And um, I'm, while I'm talking, I'm writing down a bunch of notes to myself to see if I can um, think it through a little bit more deeply. Because I, I, I think that the sugar glider potentially is going to continue to be a, a, a big problem for the conservation of some of our beasties in southern southern, uh, southern New South Wales and, and in the wet forests of Victoria, just like it is as an introduced species in Tasmania. For example, in, in the wet forests, the ash forests, we're seeing the sugar glider starting to increase in numbers, including in places where we see lead being um, So I haven't answered your question very well. I'm sorry, Bert. That's because I need no, to think about it a little bit more. Yeah. That, that's okay. Just um, and uh, just a, a quick response. It, it's particularly noticeable at that sort of altitudinal cutoff where the, the habitat may not change enormously. Squirrel, squirrel gliders will, you know, cut off as soon as the box scum type uh, woodland um, peters out. Whereas sugars will be both in that box scum habitat and several hundred metres up higher in sort of typical Herbridge foothill forest or mount, you know, mountain, um, um, you know, wetter forests of, of the foothills. So it's just, it just seems such a conundrum that two species that look at least so similar and ecologically aren't that dissimilar as far as we know, um, you know, that there's some threshold there that's having an impact. But thanks very much for, for your insight. Um, that's really, yeah, really good. Yeah, no, it's, it is interesting. The sugar glider does seem to be quite a weedy species in many cases. Um, you know, the, the sense is wet, that where there's been um, some kind of disturbance, including in these box gum woodland areas that, that I'm in at the moment, where there's been a lot of disturbance, it seems like um, sugar gliders seem to seem to come in. Um, it, the sugar, where, one of the, the plantation studies that we've been doing with the remnant patches of eucalypt forest, a uh, eucalypt woodland surrounded by pines. The sugar glider is, is one of the species that has actually done reasonably well in that heavily disturbed system. And I know that uh, they've had sugar gliders in some of the plantations in Western Victoria as well, the, the eucalypt plantations, in, in very small hollows that have developed, seem to have developed quite rapidly. So it does seem to be quite weedy. And I suppose... Maybe that's the reason why its introduction to islands off New Guinea and, and, and in Tasmania have been very, very successful. In fact, sadly so in, in the case of Tasmania and its impact on swift parrots and possibly also orange-bellied parrots. Great. Thank you so much for your question, Bert.
Uh, I'm going to encourage everyone who's here to post a question in the chat. Um, we've got time to get to plenty more questions. So if you have one for David, let's take the opportunity to ask it. Uh, I'm going to ask Robbie to unmute. Robbie, if you can hear us, feel free to unmute and ask your question. Yeah. Uh, look, I think David's answered it. Um, my question, it was more about the competition between sugar gliders and squirrel gliders. Um, I come from Lake Macquarie and we we find them uh, both in the same patches and there's some recent work to show that sugar gliders might actually be out competing squirrel gliders. So I'm just wondering if um, David had any comment on that. Um, not, not too much more than what I've uh, talked about in relation to, to Bert's comments. I, I think there's some really some room for some really good um, empirical work to look carefully at what's what's happening with those two species when they when they coexist, um, and and how how that actually might fit together or not. I I do worry that as time goes on, we see more and more homogenisation of assemblages of species, and, and the more specialised species like the squirrel glider, you know, based on past past occurrences of of similar kinds of of competition dynamics you would um you wouldn't be betting on squirrel gliders to, to survive that um so that that is a bit of a concern um i would be yeah thinking deeply about what that that um what that might mean for squirrel gliders that's that's a real concern. Is somebody studying that? It sounds like um, a project that someone like Ross Goldingay would be really um, useful to engage on that in that that part of the world. You know, he's a he's a, a fantastic scientist. That guy and has really deep understanding of of a lot of the big gliders. Um, so that that would be something if you can encourage Ross to to uh, have a student look deeply at that kind of problem. I think there could be. Um, some really important insights to come from that. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question, Robbie. And okay, um, we've got a, a session with Ross coming up after this, so that might be a good one for that session. I know that Denise McGregor is in this session. I'm wondering, Denise, if you have anything to comment on this conversation. Hi. Hi, Denise. <laughs> I wasn't How expecting I... to talk. <laughs> That's okay. I was wondering if you wanted to contribute anything or ask David anything or add to the conversation. Yeah, um, greater gliders are what I did my PhD on. Yeah. Yesterday, I felt like Trump and it was a good thing that my mic was muted because <laughs> when you guys were talking about the Queensland gliders versus the Victoria gliders uh, dealing with climate change, I so wanted to talk, but Kara did a great job of, of saying everything I would have said. But no, I, I was just thinking the same thing, like, wow, that's really interesting. It would be really interesting to see um, what sort of life history traits are you know, where they do differ and, and why one is maybe more robust. Um, but it sounded like David hit on some of the things I was thinking, but yeah, maybe someone could, could do some more in-depth study there. Absolutely. Okay. Thanks for your input, Denise. And Denise yes. has a keynote. I just like to know, Denise has a keynote um, that's available as part of this symposium as well. So if anyone here hasn't watched that yet, feel free to jump onto the BioLinks YouTube channel and catch that one there. Um, Sophie Bickford, I was wondering if you had any questions for David while we're here. Oh yeah, okay. I, I was sort of leaving it to everyone else, but David, while we've got you, it'd be um, great to ask you, going, going back to greater gliders and um, thinking about your conclusions on the talk you gave, um, and you stressed that we're really going to need to intervene to conserve these species in the future. Um, we're going to need to protect uh, what habitat remains. We've lost a lot of key habitat only recently, really, relatively recently, in the last 20 years. The old growth that we've lost is astonishing. Um, but we're going to have to restore vast tracts of forest and make them more better habitat for gliders. I just wonder, for greater gliders, um, I just wonder if you'd like to sort of expand on what you think the most key sort of restoration interventions are going to be. Are they going to be broad landscape scale management changes or are we going to have to you know, kind of look at particular locations that are strongholds and are likely to be strongholds in the future under the various climate change scenarios we're facing. 
and um, really start um, managing those landscapes differently and, and keeping fire out and looking at mixes of forest species and just wondering, yeah, it's a very broad question, but just some reflections on, I guess, the scale of the management interventions and the type of management in interventions that we really need to get cracking with. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so my, my response to these things is that it's a two, two levels. The first one is that we need to intervene at multiple scales. So if we just work through a little bit of that, one of the things we've got to do is we know that, that almost all these species we're talking about, squirrel gliders, greater gliders, and a whole armada of other things, are really strongly associated with large old trees. And we, we know that in the places that big trees have been studied carefully, populations are declining very rapidly. And, and so that, that means that lots of human activities, be it um, clearing paddock trees in agricultural landscapes, uh, removing trees from hazard reduction burning, because we know that they're highly flammable, um, logging operations, road widening operations, all those kinds of things knock out the really large old trees that these animals are, are highly dependent on. They simply can't survive without them. So often that means protecting individual trees in particular contexts. So you know, when, we, when we look at logging operations, we shouldn't be knocking down those large old trees during those operations. We should be buffering them with areas of unlogged forest. That's, that's critical. But we've also got to make sure that you, know, you don't get to be an old tree unless you're a young tree first. So you've really got to think through the whole process of recruits. And we know that some of the recruits will not make it as time goes along. So you might need five or six or even ten recruit trees to, to have one good tree uh, in 150 years' time. So retaining what we have now is critical. And that can be at the individual tree level to make an important difference. And that, that can be in a farming context or in a forestry context. We see a huge loss, a huge attrition of paddock trees right across farming landscapes in southern and eastern Australia. The second thing that I think is really important is, is that there will be climate refuges and it will be important to think carefully about, about where they are and then make sure that those places that are going to be climate refuges have as little other disturbance going on them, in them as possible. And so that means thinking strategically about how do we not burn particular parts of the landscape so that they retain many of their habitat values for some of these animals. You know, that's one of the things that's been a big problem in Northern Australia is long unburnt areas. And that's what we're starting to see in Southern Australia as well. So some, some fairly sophisticated thinking around fire and how frequently fire is reoccurring and what that's doing to, to, to some of these, these landscapes. The third thing is that there's an enormous replanting and restoration opportunity and, and therein lies opportunities with, with uh, the carbon industry, carbon storage industry. So we know, for example, in the Murray-Darling Basin, We've lost about 60 billion trees. So there are really important opportunities to put some of that vegetation back in the landscape. And we need to couple that up with additional income streams for landowners to be able to be rewarded for storing more and more carbon in the above ground vegetation on, on their farms. And there are ways to have productive farms and reasonable levels of vegetation cover without driving people off the land and driving farmers into poverty. We know that through good farm planning. So this, there are things to be done at individual tree levels, at patch levels, uh, farms, farm levels or forestry compartment levels, right through to regional levels. And we really need to embrace this as part of the decade of restoration that the United Nations has announced. You know, and we hear all this, this about reducing carbon emissions. I, I get that. But the flip side of that is increasing the amount of carbon that's stored in the landscape. And we can do that and have significant biodiverse, positive impacts on biodiversity at the same time. 
particularly given how much old forest has been lost in the last 25 years. We've got a lot to do there to make sure we don't lose any more of that, that forest and think about how we can better manage the landscape so we can grow more old forest back, back into the system. Now, that's a colossal challenge given how much fire is occurring. But as the New South Wales government showed with uh, the Wollongby Pine outcome, there are ways to, to intervene to reduce the, the risk of losing some of these really significant patches of old forest in the future if we're really serious about doing that. Yeah, thanks, David. Yeah, great answer. Thanks for your question, Sophie. I'm going to ask the user behind Leadbeater's Possum to unmute and ask their question if they'd like. Uh, thanks, Nasha. Yes, Steve here from Friends of Leddies. Um, David, overnight I've become aware that the Victorian government is amending the Wood Pulp Agreement Act to allow a small portion of the contract to be met using silver top ash instead of mountain forests. Given what we heard yesterday, the low nutritional value of um, silver top ash and its description as a fireweed, would this amendment be a positive change? And if so, would it be good to increase the portion that is being met from silver top ash instead of these uh, increasingly rare mountain forests? Yeah, that's also a really good question. And what I, I need to think a little bit more deeply about one of the, the there's no doubt that silver top ash is is not good and Cara's work and and soon to be Denise's work in this space with others Karen Ford including that's included there as well it's going to going to look at what can be done in terms of rethinking the composition of forests so there's no doubt that silver top ash is bad news for koalas and greater gliders and there's no doubt that silver top ash is a, is a fireweed. It does um, very well after recurrent fire, but also after, after timber harvesting. So we've seen the composition of the forest starting now to be skewed heavily towards that tree. And there are literally thousands of hectares of country, which is essentially a glider and koala desert. I think we need to be careful about, about how how industrialised that process becomes to take that timber because we know that sometimes these things can be quite readily distorted. So there is a need to think carefully about about what what happens with our attempts to restore the landscapes so that these are proper nutritional landscapes. Um, we know that in the 1960s, the idea of export wood chipping was to suppose to do it, clean up the forest, quote unquote, get rid of all the rubbish so that you could grow lovely, vast acres of tall, straight saw log trees and we were all going to live happily ever after. And really what happened was that the, the industry became highly distorted in southeastern New South Wales and potentially also in northeastern Victoria, where, you know, Upwards of 90% of everything that was cut ended up in the pulp stream, the wood chip stream, and then the forest composition has been radically altered as, as a result. So we need to tread carefully in that space. I think industrial thinning would be quite detrimental on a large scale. I think ecological thinning could be very useful, but we need to be careful about, about the kinds of long-term commitments that we would make because these things do come back to bite us and they do come back to, to create enormous problems um, in the way we manage forests. So there's, there's some, some careful policy making that needs to happen in that space so that we don't end up with some perverse outcomes. And I, I, I think to, to do large scale ecological thinning, it's, it's gonna take resources it's, we may be able to defray some of the cost of doing that by directing some of that, that uh, material into the pulp stream. But we already know that, that pulp wood is, is largely loss making anyway. So we need to be careful about what the economics looks like as well as what the, the ecological outcomes are. You know, these, some of these large scale problems are not 
not always easily, easily resolved. That's why we need to make sure that we're making good decisions and not creating the next set of nightmares for people in 10 years' time. Mm. Uh, thanks, David. If the, um, if the silver top ash were logged and then reseeded with species like um, mountain ash, and alpine ash, and gum, would it be an opportunity to actually improve habitat? Um, I We'd have to look at what the mixes of tree species are. Um, a lot of the silvertop ash issue is is lower elevation. Yeah. So so um, there'll be different mixes of other tree species to go in there. Mountain ash is is a fairly patchy and marginal species in northeastern Victoria. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a different beastie compared to the Central Highlands or the Hotways or parts of Tasmania. Right. So there'll, the, there's going to need to be some really detailed thinking. We have plans for some experimental work to look at um, what needs to be done to start to change the composition of the tree species mix in some parts of, of northeastern Victoria. So Cara and Denise and Karen Ford and myself and, and others from the, from the department have started to think about what might this mean. But it's going in terms of how do we roll this out experimentally to begin with, and what's entailed, how much effort's involved. Um, it's a big it's a big task because the scale of the change in the composition of the forest is is also quite substantial, and and so the implications for animals like koalas and and greater gliders are also very substantial and. Um, it's it's a tra it's a challenge, but it's one we have to address because it it impacts not only the greater glider, but it has got big impacts on koalas and potentially other species as well. Uh, I think it's a it's one of those unforeseen changes that nobody in the 1960s uh, would have contemplated was going to happen in terms of the composition of the forest. But this is where we are, so that's why we need to to um, to think carefully about how to resolve a complex problem like this and not rush into something that, that might actually have other perverse outcomes that at the moment we can't see because we haven't thought about it carefully enough. Yeah. Thank, thanks, David. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Really helpful. Um, the reason given for the amendment was simply um, to be able to continue to meet commercial contracts. I very much doubt any of this detailed conservation uh, consideration has been put into this decision. Thank you. Well, there's, there's a fundamental difference between ecological thinning and industrial thinning. Um, yeah, industrial thinning is, has some pretty strong parallels to thinning that takes place in plantations. Mm. Uh, as you see in the ash forests, and as, as uh, I've been seeing this week in, in extensive areas of pine forest, you know, the, the, the aim of the game is to take out every third row in, in a pine plantation. And that first thinning is basically for, uh, in this case, pines, is for, is for um, pine pulp that's, that's uh, manufactured by Busy. Mm -hmm. But it's an industrial process and it changes, it, um, it, it increases the growth rate of what's remaining. Uh, and, and in eucalypt forests, it has a couple of effects. It, it, um, it, it can lead to increased fire, fires, fire risk. There are studies that have shown that. And we know that more fire will lead to more silver top ash. So, so there's some, some things to do to resolve here. And, and an industrial approach to change the composition of the forest would need to be um, very carefully thought through to make sure that we solve the problem and the solution isn't worse than what it was in the first place. Thank you so much for your question, Steve. I'm gonna ask Paul McGregor to unmute and ask their question if you'd like. Uh, yeah, thanks. Um, David, um, we're at Tallulah State Forest and we're doing greater glider surveys. Greater glider action statement says more than five greater gliders per spotlight kilometer is a trigger for habitat retention re-logging. 
get the action statement up out of yesterday is not legally enforceable. What is your view on the approach to take with the Office of Conservation Regulator and Vic Forests about legally enforceable numbers of greater gliders to minimise logging? And have there been any test cases on this so far? Uh, there's, there's some quite specific details there that I'm not really across at this stage. Um, let me... Can I write some of those things down that you've just said? So can can you... So that I can follow them up? I've actually got a pen and oh. I've got a pencil and pad here. So um, okay. I almost need to take that question on notice. So they're talking about um, the numbers of gliders Per, per unit distance. Of... Yeah, it's actually per, per kilometre with 25 metres either side of the transect. So that they specify more than five greater gliders in that transect. Um, and that's, that's the specification in the action statement for greater gliders. Um, so the question is and what... That's... But that's not legally enforceable, as we were advised yesterday in yesterday's webinar. So what is your view on the approach we should take with numbers that we should be recording and how do we enforce that with um, Big Forest and what do we advise the Office of Conservation Regulator? And my last point was, in order to minimise logging, and my last point was, have there been any test cases on greater glider habitat retention in face of logging yet? Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, it does. Um, I'll... I'm just writing it down because um, I don't I don't have the answers on that. It's possible that Steve Meacher might have some more insight into that regarding court cases. Um, I I haven't been involved in in the recent court cases on it, um, and yeah. by and large, we don't we use the stag watching method for detections of gliders rather than the um, the spotlighting method that's that's in the Victorian wet forests. We're about to embark on a, a, um, a once off snapshot spotlight of all of our long, all 180 long term sites. Um, Lockheed McBurney's going to start on that in, um, in a few weeks' time once, once uh, he's out of lockdown. Um, but I, I need to look a little bit more into the detail of, of what you've just talked about. I'm sorry I can't answer yeah. that off straight off the top of my head, but maybe Steve Meacher, who just asked the previous question, might have a, a few more insights in relation to the court cases. What we'll do is we'll try and um, get an answer from you as soon as we can, David, and then circulate it to this group as well. So if you do come back to us with anything, David, we'll make sure that everyone who's attended this session gets that answer. Um, I'd like to ask okay. Kylie, uh, to unmute and go ahead with your question, if you can hear us. Uh, g'day, yes. Um, David, I was just wondering about the interaction with greater gliders in, in pine plantations. Do they use them at all? Yeah, um, okay. Interesting question. Um, where I'm sitting at the moment, on the top of a hill, I can actually see a brand, not a brand new, but a, a, a pine plantation that we've worked in since 1994. And... Um, Greater gliders are in the narrowleaf peppermint and uh, managum or eucalyptus femenalis. Here they call it ribbon gum. Victoria, it's managum. Tasmania, it's white gum. Um, so the greater gliders are mostly in that kind of forest and they will occupy remnants of, you know, down to one to two hectares of eucalypt forest within, within that pine plantation. But they won't. They won't eat the. Um, they won't live in the pine forest itself. Some of the. Sometimes some of the male cones of pines are eaten by greater gliders, but not much. Um, they're, they're, um, there's a little bit of that that was consumed, but not very much. Um, Cara also did her PhD out here, looking at gliders. What we did find was that there were occasional rare movements of gliders between the patches of, of uh, eucalypt forest in the system. They're not, greater gliders are not in the woodland patches to the northern end of the plantation. There's a 15,000 hectare uh, section of the plantation here 
that has woodland patches in it, but there are no greater gliders in it. There's only um, common brush tail possums, sugar gliders, and uh, ringtail possums. So the ringtail possums will eat pine cones and pine needles, but greater gliders don't tend to do that very much. Um, I just think that eucalypt, that greater gliders are such uh, eucalypt specialists that uh, trying to eat pine pine needles and pine cones is a, is a pretty rude shock for them. The original work that was done on disturbance and greater gliders was actually done here by Hugh Tyndall Bisco, and he dis- he was the one that discovered that greater gliders are highly disturbance sensitive and they just die on site. And so that was that was rather alarming work. That was published in 1969. Now Hugh was an incredibly thorough scientist and. He recorded the locations of every single one of the animals that they caught during the process of clearing the landscape to put in the plantation. And we were able to retrieve the DNA from those original specimens in various museums around Australia and compare it to the DNA of animals that are still in the plantation now, uh, 60 years later. So... um, Gliders have persisted in the biggest in the biggest of patches, but those patches have to be dominated by narrowleaf peppermint and ribbon gum for animals to survive. Um, and the smaller patches, especially where there's mostly um, red stringy bark or some of the box gum um, eucalypts like yellow box or white box greater gliders, uh, won't survive. They don't seem to like mountain gum too much either. They're very fussy out in this part of the world. Anyway, so that's a long answer to what should have been a, 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 a sh- which was a short question. My apologies. No, oh, great. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kylie. Uh, and I'm going to ask Michelle to unmute. Hello. Uh, you've got a question about virus and parasites? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, uh, because we learn a lot uh, from the symposium that the Climate change logging and hobbits would affect that gliders um, numbers. Uh, I also like to inquire about the weather there. Other like parasites or viruses that also cause the decline of the gliders or squirrel gliders. Thank you. So, so what we've discovered when we've been working with all the different species that we've worked in over worked on over the last four decades is that all the different species have different um, parasites in their fur. So they have different ectoparasites, different fleas and ticks and the like. And um, they also have uh, different bloodborne diseases or, or, or um, internal parasites called endoparasites. And you kind of you would kind of expect that for animals that have been living here in Australia for 10, 15, 20 million years, uh, you would expect there to be um, you'd expect them to, to to have different 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 kinds of parasites. Um, it's not an area of my expertise, although my wife is a wildlife vet and spent a long time um, looking at looking at various blood um, blood assays for greater gliders. And there are remarkably few things that gliders carried. Now, that doesn't mean that disease is, isn't important. The problem with disease in back, at background levels in populations is that you almost never find diseased animals because they die. And, uh, you know, they might die in a hollow or they might be predated because they're slower, um, and so wildlife disease can be very difficult to work with unless you're working with a disease that has enormous widespread impacts. You know, things like um, uh, chytrid fungus in, in, uh, in, in frogs and other amphibians is, is an exception. And uh, devil facial tumour in, in Tasmania with Tasmanian devils. So... Is it possible that some diseases will become more prevalent with climate change? Most definitely. Um, what will be the effects on gliders? I think nobody knows because there's been very, very limited 
work on the different diseases, including viruses, in uh, in the vast majority of Australian animals. So I, there's a there's a uh, an extraordinary parasitologist guy, uh, Ian Beveridge, who lives in Victoria, and one of Australia's truly great parasitologists, uh, Dave Spratt, who used to be at CSIRO, um, is now very ill. And there are very few people that are now coming through in that field to really understand wildlife diseases. So it's an enormous knowledge gap that we have in, an, in Australia, and we're losing expertise very quickly in that space as well. So it's a good question, and I'm sorry I can't answer it in more detail because um, I simply don't know. I, I can ask and find out some more from people who might know. Um, I, we do have a few papers that we've written on the haematology and blood values and blood diseases of, of greater gliders, and I'm happy to send that to the conference organisers to send on to you if that would be useful. That sounds great, David. Thank you so much, and thank you for your question, Michelle. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, well, that comes to the end of our time today. I just want to quickly thank Jerry Alexander for answering a few of your questions in the chat. So I appreciate your contributions, Jerry. And obviously a big thank you to David Lindemeyer coming in from the field, taking the time to answer all of your questions. So a massive thanks to you, David. Really appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I'm sorry I wasn't across more things to be able to um to provide a bit more information for people. My apologies. I'll, I will go away when I get home and see what I can find to send to you to send on to some of some of the uh, people online. That would be wonderful. I'm sure everyone here would appreciate it. So thank you very much. And we'll, uh, we'll leave it there.